In my last video, I have been talking about eigenvalue centrality as a one um, rather sophisticated and uh, mathematically elegant way of defining the importance of nodes within a network structure based only on the structure, on the shape of the graph. <clears throat> now, this was very nice, but it had some flaws, namely that uh, certain graphs wouldn't work with it. So if there is a dead end in your graph or a spider trap, as we have called it, then uh, the results that you will get for centrality will be highly unfair. Certain nodes, maybe even all of them, will lose all their probability weight and uh, go down to zero. And you do not get a meaningful centrality measure after all. So now let's discuss how we can fix that. And to go there, I will um, present you two possible fixes, um, namely uh, cuts and page centrality. Um, page more commonly known as page rank and not page centrality, um, but uh, cuts is actually cut centrality. Okay, <clears throat> so welcome back to these uh, videos in our little graph knowledge, gra uh, pardon, pardon, uh, little uh, course knowledge graphs at TU Dresden. Okay, we are nearing the end of the semester. I'm running out of words. Now, for computing the eigenvector centrality, I have used matrix multiplication. And it turns out that actually matrix multiplication has more uses than that and is in general a quite nice and useful tool to look at. And uh, this is what I would like to start with before I fix eigenvalue centrality. Um, I will go to another use of matrix multiplication. <clears throat> so what you see here is the same graph that I have used last time with my four nodes and directed edges between them. But this time I use a matrix which is the pure adjacency matrix. So this is not a stochastic matrix that represents probabilities of moving somewhere. This is just a matrix representing the graph structure. We have a one if there is an edge and if we have a zero if not. Again, I read this column by column. So for example, uh, the first column is A, meaning that from A you cannot go to A, but you can go to B, to C and to D and so on. From B you can go to A, not to B, not to C, but to D, and so on. Okay, <clears throat> so this is the adjacency matrix. And instead of now um, doing the multiplication with an initial vector in order to get a probability of being somewhere um, based on probabilities, I can also take this matrix here, this adjacency matrix, and run matrix multiplication over it. And <clears throat> this will give us interesting results indeed. So if you take the multiplication of the matrix with itself, and I invite you to do this on paper to see that this is really the outcome and I haven't miscalculated, then you get this new matrix here. There's a two in here, there's ones. And if you do another multiplication, you get even threes, fours, twos, ones, and still zero here. Um, and it turns out that these products of uh, mat the matrix or powers, I should say, of the matrix have a very natural and useful practical implementation. Namely, they are the numbers of paths that exist of a certain length. This was already true with the adjacency matrix. This is, it encodes the numbers, the number of paths of length one. But if we take the um, product with itself, then we get the number of paths of length two. Let's see if that's really true. Let's maybe look at this number here. Um, this stands for the possibilities of going from B to B again. Um, <clears throat> so is, are there really two different length two paths from B to B? Well, I could go down to D and back up. That's a length two path bringing me from B to B. I could also go to A and back to B. That's another one. So these are the two paths and there's no further. Um, the matrix down here claims that there are three distinct paths from going um, from A to B, which have length three. Maybe we can see if we can find them too. So three paths, so I could go to B and then go to D and then go back. I could go to B and to A and back, or I could go well, to C and to A and then to B. Uh, that would also be a length three path. Okay, so matrix multiplication is for path counting and uh, this uh, will of course also converge to a, a transitive closure in the end. So the non-zero entries in this uh, power will eventually be 
um, those uh, <coughs> mark the pairs of nodes which are connected at all by some uh, path of arbitrary length. Yeah. Okay, so is that good for anything? Well, it's good for several things, but is it good for anything related to centrality? So remember, we want to figure out how important a certain node is. And um, the question therefore has to be, can we use path counting to compute centrality? So the idea is a node is central if many paths lead to it. I have presented this idea, this notion before, as we discussed high level ideas for centrality. So this seems to be reasonable. Now, <laughs> there is a catch, however, because uh, if you count the paths that lead to a node and you allow for paths that go in cycles, just like the ones I just showed you, so which pass through one node or edge multiple times, then often you will find that there are infinitely many paths for, that lead to any node. So this is not an interesting number. If you have a fully connected or a strongly connected graph and in the end you just find that every node has infinitely many incoming paths, um, this does not help you in ranking the nodes by importance. So some solution for this has to be found. No? Problem, there can be an infinite number of directed paths if a graph has cycles at all. <clears throat> okay, so what can we do about that? And this is the idea that is really important for cut centrality. Somehow we have to um, make sure that our computation converges to a finite number even though there are infinitely many paths. And um, the solution has been presented quite early on, actually. This is work from 1953 um, uh, by a researcher called uh, Leo Katz. So uh, a particularly well-chosen name if, if your family name is Katz to call your child Leo. Uh, Katz, of course, being the German word for cat. Yeah. Um, <coughs> so uh, easy to remember name and uh, with an important contribution um, by this centrality and maybe by other things, I can't tell. Um, the idea simply is that longer paths are penalized. So we want to discount the importance of uh, longer paths um, by multiplying them with rapidly shrinking powers of some number, which we call the attenuation factor alpha, smaller than one. So definition, <clears throat> given an n times n column-based adjacency matrix M and a real number alpha between 0 and 1, the inbound or receiving cut centrality of a node I, which is between 0 and, um, or I should say between 1 and n, if it's an n times n matrix, <clears throat> is the result of uh, the following limit here. So the limit is an infinite sum, a sum over all k greater or equal to 1. And for each of these k, what we do is we, um, let's first maybe look at the inner term, we take the kth power of the attenuation factor, because this is a number smaller than 1, this will be smaller than 1 to it, will shrink rapidly. We are um, taking uh, something that uh, will shrink very quickly and we multiply this scalar value with the kth power of the matrix. So we multiply um, k times with itself, meaning that it will then contain the numbers that uh, correspond to the length, paths of length k inside. But instead of having these very fast growing numbers, we multiply each number with this, with this very fast shrinking alpha power in order to keep it in its bounds somehow. Okay, and now comes this inner sum interplay. What we actually do is to compute the centrality of a particular node i is we um, sum over all j from 1 to n uh, the values of the matrix at coordinate i j. So in other words, we just go through the ith row of the matrix and we add up all the values that we find in this row. That's this inner sum here. Okay, <clears throat> so this is also said here. It's the sum of the alpha to the power of k weighted sums of the ith row of in this uh, kth power of uh, m. Okay, right. So this is how it's computed. Um, there are some pieces in this definition. One probably has to take a moment to, to fully understand it. But uh, the idea is really quite simple. 
if you allow for longer and longer paths, the number of such paths will grow very fast. We know that actually from our knowledge graphs exercises. We have already uh, talked about the number of um, even simple paths in, in small cliques and how many they can get and use this as a justification for why certain query languages refuse to count paths because the numbers are so big that you can't fit them into memory of any machine, even for very tiny graphs. And um, so we know that the number of paths is a fast growing, uh, fast growing measure if you uh, allow for a few steps. And <clears throat> To counteract this fast growth, we have to have a very fast shrinking attenuation factor, which means that longer paths are less and less important <clears throat> because they tend to be much more frequent. We have to um, make them uh, less important. Obviously, the question arises, how much less important do we have to make them in order really to control this uh, phenomenal uh, growth, which we might uh, observe in such a setting and um, this is what this note states here and um, for this to really work alpha must not be too large um, precisely one can estimate that alpha should be smaller than one divided by the absolute of r where r is the eigenvalue of m with the largest absolute value now this seems familiar we have talked about eigenvalues of largest absolute value also when discussing eigenvalue centrality so these seem to come up once and again in these uh, parts of math. Okay, so this is this would be a safe choice. Now, whether we know this or not is another question, but often one can have a good estimation and then see what happens. Okay, so let's discuss what we just saw. So um, what CUTS achieves is it overcomes the problems of pure eigenvector approaches. For one thing, dead ends do not drain all the weight from the remaining graph. Um, cut central is even meaningful for acyclic graphs, meaning for graphs which never come back to the origin. For example, for tree-shaped graphs, you could still compute cut centrality and you would get values which have some uh, sense. Um, so uh, it, this is uh, automatically true. Also, spider traps do not drain all weight from the remaining graph, um, but they still have a certain centrality advantage. A spider trap will have uh, a larger number of paths leading to each of the elements inside this uh, cycle than uh, a node that is outside and only is, is feeding towards the spider trap uh, could possibly have. So um, spider traps can still manipulate the scores, but they will not dominate the whole uh, metric in such a strong way. Okay. Um, so this is the positive side. Uh, but there's also some challenges with cut centrality. Um, in particular, we need to pick the attenuation factor. So, um, and the values that you will get and also the um, relative ordering of the nodes that you will get by this measure of importance will depend on the choice of this number. What is the intuition? Well, roughly large values, meaning not so quick attenuation, not so quick uh, reduction of weight for the longer paths will make us consider long paths, which means that results become somewhat similar to eigenvector centrality. So more weight will be drained through the dead ends and or, or to the, through the spider traps at least um, in uh, comparison to if you would look at shorter paths. On the other hand, if you have very small attenuation factors, it means that um, your uh, paths lose in importance very quickly as they get longer and essentially you focus on very short paths. So um, the result is shifted more towards in-degree centrality. <coughs> By the way, I should also measure, mention that of course all of this cut centrality can also be defined uh, in a similar fashion to uh, measure importance by the number of paths that go out of a certain node. Um, so that's easily possible by just uh, modifying the definition slightly. But in my version, I'm looking at the number of incoming paths. So we get a similarity to in-degree centrality and also to eigenvector centrality, where we also wonder how many paths lead to a certain place, making a random walker more likely to end up there. So um, all of this can be flipped around uh, if applications require this. But of course, you can also just simply flip the order, the direction of the edges of your network if 
this makes sense for your application. <coughs> okay, so cut centrality, nice approach. But I promised you another one, which of course is also nice and uh, also somewhat important. It's a slightly different modification um, of the eigenvector centrality that was um, proposed by Brin and Page, uh, two people who are more um, widely known for uh, their um, commercial activities than for their contributions to uh, network analysis as such. Um, <clears throat> but, and, uh, but in a certain sense, uh, this contribution might have had something to do with their commercial success, at least initially. Um, so uh, this goes back to 1996, uh, which uh, of course uh, is also quite some time ago, but um, was a long time after cuts. So these things are not, not closely related in a sense in their discovery. And uh, the goal there in this page rank was to address the limits of eigenvector centrality um, while keeping the idea of a random walker. So it's much closer to eigenvalue centrality and it's, it's closer to the random walker, but it tries to somehow fix the problem that uh, the problems of this metric in a easy to implement fashion. And uh, the idea is quite uh, simple for that. We still consider random walks based on a stochastic transition matrix, just as we did before. But in addition to the plain operation of walking along the paths, we now also allow walkers to teleport to a random new location with some small probability one minus beta beta just being a number between zero and one that you have to set another parameter here, sim similar to the alpha, which we just had for cuts. <clears throat> so this is the teleport operation and uh, it just puts you again randomly on some place in the graph. And this uh, is a nice feature because by teleporting you can move out of spider traps and you can also move out of the abyss that you might end up in when you fall off a dead end. Uh, and uh, your random, uh, your, your probability mass is otherwise lost. <coughs> so uh, there's an iterative computing scheme for that, which implements this intuitive idea. And it's very simple. Um, the new vector of uh, probabilities that we obtain is um, for some damping factor beta. Uh, this beta multiplied by what we would get by eigenvector centrality in one step. So we multiply the matrix probabilities with V to get the new probabilities of getting to any location by moving along the edges. And to this, we add the probability of having teleported, which is just one minus beta. So it's uh, the rest of uh, the probability mass here divided by N because there is a probability of one divided by N to end up in any place. Yeah? So this is, uh, the uh, result we want there and this is not quite nicely written maybe because what we want here is of course a vector so i should maybe express this as a column vector which has exactly this number in all positions so i um, want to say that uh, for each um, location this is the edit uh, um, added weights that you get in each step. <laughs> okay, so there's a chance, so every node gets some incoming walkers in each step or some, some probable fractions of incoming walkers in each step, no matter where they have been before that. And this shortens uh, the walks because you cannot walk very fast until you will again be randomly teleported, but it also makes sure that no place of the network is completely dried out of attention and will not uh, get any visitors anymore because there's always incoming teleporters. Right, okay, page rank. So that's the idea. Now, does that work in practice? Well, for web search and similar applications, um, one is usually picking a beta that is close to um, 85%. So 85% chance of continuing to move and 15% chance of trans teleportation. Um, but uh, you can need very different factors to get good results. Not sure what optimal means here, but let's say good and practically feasible results. Um, so this is a trial and error thing. There's no clear rule of what to pick here as a value. Um, but as I said, 
picking a large value means that uh, you can walk longer paths but it means that you are closer to eigenvalue centrality and you have the same or eigenvector centrality and you have the same problems as this pure eigenvector centrality would have so dead ends and spider traps will affect the results on the other hand if you have a very small dampening factor it means that uh, you get rid of these problems but your walkers are teleporting all the time and um, so you get a very local perspective you cannot walk for very long if uh, you are constantly teleported around and uh, see differences between the nodes will be uh, smaller than in terms of uh, the centrality that you get. <clears throat> okay, computationally, it turns out that iterative computation works very well here. Again, similar to what you have with eigenvector, um, it often converges very quickly. I mean, surprisingly quickly. It said that 50 to 75 iterations are enough to compute page ranks for the web to the limits of double precision. So double numbers, this is quite uh, exact and it should suffice for most applications. So, okay, of course, 50 iterations over the whole web graph is still a, a large amount of computation, but in terms of number of iterations, it's very small for this size. So um, iteration works. And <clears throat> one can also show by theoretical analysis that the limit is indeed uh, also characterized by a nice equation, which is similar to the iterative update uh, rule that we had. So the vector will really be the result of this addition, where the second again is to be read as another vector. Um, <clears throat> okay, this is also would be a, a fully uh, algebraic formulation of the problem, but really solving this directly without having this iterative approach is not really feasible for large networks. So the typical approach of computing this is the iteration. And this is what, what everyone does these days. Um, it is fast, but of course we should remember that when we say fast here, it still means fast for batch computation. It's not so fast that you could have a live query service giving you these numbers in practical reality. So uh, this is on a different level of fast than what we would say is fast when we talk about things like Sparkle or another query language where you expect somewhat interactive behavior where you can just um, pose a query and get a result within seconds or milliseconds. So this is not going to work if you have to start an iteration with such large matrices. Okay, <clears throat> now to finish this video, let's compare the two. Um, page versus cuts. Okay, cuts was 50 years earlier. That's uh, one uh, difference that we have already seen. But Otherwise, uh, in spite of this historical um, dif distance, we can see some strong parallels between the two algorithms. First of all, uh, both of them are all paths criteria. So we look at all possible paths in the network and we uh, base our decisions on the numbers of paths leading to a node. So in cuts, this is explicitly counted the number of paths, but also for eigenvector centrality, the number of paths plays a big role, of course, in uh, aggregating probability mass at a certain node. The more paths lead to a place, the more probability will flow there, the more random walkers will move there. <clears throat> and in both cases, we have a parameter to reduce the impact of long paths. And this parameter in both cases is a bit of black magic and has to be uh, fiddled with in order to get good results. So this is, uh, it's not just one approach which you just throw at a problem and it will give you something nice, but you have to figure out how to configure these approaches to get what you are looking for. Now, the main difference is that cuts propagates the full discounted weight of all successors of a node. What do I mean by that? It means that if a node is reachable by many paths and it has many, uh, many uh, successors, then all of them will get the benefit of being reachable by many paths. Whereas page rank splits the weight across all the successors. If you have one web page and it links to many other web pages, each of them will only get a small fraction of the importance. And this seems, of course, intuitively more useful for a, a situation as we have on the web. If you have a large uh, a page, which is just a collection of links to many other places, then uh, it shouldn't be the case that all of these other places get large weights because of that. But somehow the attention is split as the attention of a real reader might be split among those things. So that makes sense. <clears throat> so we could, phrase it as this, a cut centrality a node is important if it is highly linked 
or if it is linked from other important nodes. Whereas in PageRank, a node is important if it is highly linked or if it is, if it is linked from other important nodes that do not link many other pages, yeah? if it gets the full attention of other important nodes. Right, so this would be intuitive ways of stating this. <clears throat> now, as I said, page might be more um, useful for the web. Uh, there's some empirical evidence for that, right? We have Google, um, even though, of course, today Google uses many other things. It's not based on page rank alone. Um, but uh, it, of course, we shouldn't think that cuts isn't also meaningful. There are many scenarios where the um, splitting of uh, attention is not really happening and wouldn't make much sense to consider. For example, think of protein interaction networks, um, whether a protein interacts with, with many other proteins or with just a few, um, it's not clear that this should lead us to discount the importance that uh, flows through it to all of its successes. So um, if there are many scenarios, many, many uh, uh, kinds of networks where a cuts approach is maybe the better one. So um, as I said, it really depends on the application. We shouldn't uh, jump to conclusions just because Google is using it. It must be the right one. It really depends on the application. <clears throat> okay. Of course, PageRank has also received outsized um, prominence due to the sheer commercial success of it. So many things, whether appropriate or not, have always first used PageRank for uh, addressing a problem. And uh, you will find many more implementations of PageRank than of cut centrality. But um, I'm not sure that this is, can be justified by uh, on, on objective grounds. It's probably just a, a trend in uh, IT, at least for a while. Okay, right. So that was what I wanted to say about cuts and page centrality. Two all-path eigenvector style centralities. Um, there are more centralities that one can talk about. And in my next um, video, I would like to, to still mention a few of them as kind of uh, bonus material at the end of this lecture, um, which may or may not be very um, relevant for upcoming examinations, at least in 2020, where we have, <coughs> or I should say 21 by now, where we have this uh, rather um, abridged and uh, special type of semester uh, with uh, the um, pandemic situation as it is right now. Right. So um, <clears throat> thank you for watching and see you soon in the next video. Bye bye.